The American economy starts to open its doors, but are consumers ready to come back? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, Speaker Nancy Pelosi. This is very unusual that we have such a strong bipartisan uh, advocacy uh, for legislation. Larry Summers. I think there's a risk that there are going to be big increases in the number of cases. Bank of America's Brian Moynihan. The U.S. economy is going to be dependent on the activity of the consumer uh, base. Jillian Tett of the Financial Times. We have had this extraordinary disconnect between the economy and the stock market. Lloyd Blankfein. Historical critics of the banks would have to acknowledge that they've been, that they're very liquid, liquid and fairly safe. And restaurateur Danny Meyer. It's been pretty hard with decreasing uh, margins for many, many years. Every state in the union lifted its restrictions this week, at least a little bit. And the markets, well, they held their breath to find out whether consumers felt safe enough to come back outside again. The numbers of cases are down, the testing is up, and there's even talk of a possible vaccine. But is this an indication of a true pivot toward recovery, or are we just wishing ourselves to success? The one thing everyone seemed to agree on is that the answer lies with the consumer. It will be a combination of getting the virus under control, uh, development of therapeutics, development of a vaccine, all of those things. We hope and pray for a vaccine and, and some uh, therapies. There will be a burst of activity in some of these places as people who have been you know, in their homes for six, five, six, seven, eight weeks go back out and do things, and then will that sustain? In the end, it's not really an economic question at all. It's a question of public health and whether people feel safe enough to re-enter the marketplace. And to help us answer that question, we welcome back now Wall Street Week contributor Jillian Tett, who is editor-at-large at the Financial Times as well as chair of the editorial board. Great to have you back, Jillian. Help us answer that question. Is it going to require a vaccine? Do we have to get that far before people really feel comfortable going back to work, back to stores, back to restaurants and bars? Or can we have enough testing and contact tracing to really do the trick? Well, if you judge from what happened on the market this week, the investors currently think it's going to have to be a vaccine because as soon as we had that news from Moderna, basically shares shot up dramatically and everyone thought, yes, there is an end in sight. But the reality, as all the medical experts keep stressing, is a vaccine's probably a year away. Um, maybe less if we're very lucky, but not a lot less. Um, so I suspect that the key focus in the coming weeks is going to be on testing, 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 because that's really the essential element that's going to decide whether people feel confident enough. We're dealing right now with a problem of not just economics or medical science, but also psychology and how people feel. And in many ways, the most interesting example to date has been Georgia, because Georgia reopened a long way ahead of the rest of America. And the reality is that the economy has not bounced back, um, nor is consumer spending. And in fact, Politico has just done some research suggesting that amazingly, about 40% of the workforce has been filing for unemployment insurance. So, you know, it's going to take a long time to get back, unfortunately. And when it comes to the question of testing and the contact tracing and things, a lot of people put a lot of faith in apps, in technology. You wrote in the Financial Times this week saying uh, apps are nice, they're helpful, but it's not enough. You need some shoe leather involved, such as being done in Massachusetts. Well, it's very interesting because um, we spent the last few years obsessed with AI and big data and assuming that they could solve every problem under the sun, but also being pretty terrified of this. And just stop to think for a moment, how much talk have you heard about AI in the last few weeks? I mean, even big data to a degree is not exactly having its moment in the sun because the reality is that yes, you can use these amazing smartphone apps and yes, you can use all these banks of data. But if you're trying to reach people effectively with a calming message, which is going to be so critical for getting confidence back and getting consumer spending back, if you're wanting to gather the kind of qualitative data you need to actually have to track um, a pandemic, you need to combine both social science and big data, computer science. There are some people who are doing that. Paul Farmer, 
who is regarded as something of a hero in the medical world because he's done a lot of work in emerging market countries like Haiti, um, has basically been used or asked by the governor of Massachusetts to come into his state and essentially take the same lessons he's used in emerging markets into America to try and combine you know, the human contact, social science, and b big data, data science. You're seeing that in other places like Ohio, and it's increasingly being rolled out. But it's interesting for anyone who thinks the future is going to be all tech, because right now that's just not the case, or not if we want to move, move forward effectively. Well, when you talk about moments in the sun, certainly Chairman Jay Powell of the Fed had his moment in the sun this week, along with Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, as they testified on Capitol Hill. There was a lot of testimony about all the things that have been done, both fiscally and monetarily, to support the economy. But one thing that did not get a lot of attention were some of the swap lines. That's something you also wrote about this week in Financial Times. And you think maybe historically, when history's written, that may be a bigger deal. Yeah, I think it's an issue that investors should be focusing on a lot more because everyone's f tracking, understandably, what Mnuchin and Powell are doing in the U.S. economy. But what the Fed has done in the last six, eight weeks in relation to the offshore dollar market, these are entities around the world that have either borrowed in dollars or lent in dollars um, and don't have access to the Fed directly. Um, what it's done for that is absolutely fascinating. There's quite a regime change going on. And the issue is this. Um, until 2008, the Fed basically wasn't doing anything to support those offshore dollar markets. Then we had the Lehman Brothers crisis, and the Fed stepped in and created swaps lines with other central banks, which basically turned other central banks in places like Switzerland and the UK and Canada into branches of the Fed to dispense dollars to the other non-American entities that needed them to survive the crisis. 2008 finishes, we then think, okay, what's going to happen next? Was that just an emergency short-term measure? And there's remarkably little debate about what actually is the future of these dollar swaps lines. What we found out in the middle of March, when the markets began to gyrate crazily, was that the Fed is not just as committed as it was in 2008, but it's actually been doubling down dramatically in this respect. And it's not just reactivated this, the dollar swaps lines, or rather they've always been there. It's actually um, got them going again. It's expanded the group from five central banks to 14 central banks, and it's created a repo function. And to date, um, according to the material I've seen, about half a trillion has been sent out essentially through these swap lines to jurisdictions around the world. The biggest single user has been Japan by quite a long shot because mm -hmm. Japanese banks and life insurance companies have built up massive exposures to U.S. credit and other dollar-based instruments in recent years very quietly. Most people don't know. They haven't noticed. And the key thing to understand about this is that the Fed's actions have not just reduced the stress dramatically in global markets. It essentially signaled to every single investor around the world, if you are operating in an offshore dollar market, don't worry, the Fed's now got a new safety net, which is going to be there to support you. It's incredibly important. And as I say, I find it stunning there's been less discussion about it, because actually this has big implications about where the dollar-based financial system is going to be going after COVID-19. Well, and this, I'm sure, is not necessarily why the Fed did it, but it may have big implications in the rivalry between the United States and China, because China has wanted to actually reduce the importance of the dollar globally. This may fight against that. I think the key reason why the Fed's done it is actually not as an act of charity, um, and not even necessarily to, as a, some kind of great nationalist, let's you know push the dollar on everybody in the world. It's really because the Fed's realized, and the Treasury as well, that what happens in these offshore dollar markets, which are huge, we ignore them day in, day out, but they are huge. What happens in the offshore dollar markets has a huge implication for what happens on the onshore dollar markets and the treasuries markets. Um, so in a sense, it's an act of you know, self-defense to be doing this, um, or self-interest, if you like. But it does have a big implication going forward, because if investors around the world dealing in dollar assets now think they don't need to panic if there's a crisis because their local central bank can still get access to dollars, right. like a branch of the Fed, They'll keep using dollars, right. and that will help the dollar's status right. as a global currency, which comes right. just as China and Russia are trying to undermine right. that. China won't be happy. Exactly. It's a fascinating, fascinating story that you have in the Financial Times. Thank you so much to Jillian Tett from the Financial Times. Coming up, Speaker Nancy Pelosi thinks she knows what the public needs to feel confident, and it's going to require some more help from the federal government. Chairman of the Fed, Powell, has said 
that is responsibility of elected representatives to use uh, the tax and spend responsibilities that we have uh, in a way that helps the economy. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Congress has already appropriated trillions of dollars to shore up the economy. But Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi says more needs to be done to help tens of millions of Americans out of work and hundreds of millions across the country to ensure their safety as they go back into the marketplace. The American people fully support what we are doing. Uh, two to one already, just, it's just newly passed, uh, they support the provisions of our bill and oppose the Senate obstructing it. Uh, so I'm, I have confidence in public opinion. Also, when it's bipartisan across the country, uh, we have uh, less than a trillion dollars that goes to states, localities, tribes, and, and territorial governments uh, that uh, provide jobs for people across the country. So we have Democratic and Republican mayors, governors, uh, county executives, and the rest very enthusiastic about the legislation and making their voices known uh, to the, uh, the members of the United States Senate. This is un very unusual that we have such a strong bipartisan uh, advocacy uh, for legislation of this kind, which is meeting resistance uh, in the Senate. But I don't think for long, because what we have in the bill is disciplined, it's focused, it's all necessary, and it has broad bipartisan support in the country. It's just a matter of time. They want to pause, but as I've said here before, hunger doesn't take a pause, losing your job doesn't take a pause, all of the, uh, paying the rent doesn't take a pause. We really need to meet the needs of the American people and at the same time provide stimulus to the economy. Also, Chairman of the Fed, Powell, has said that it's responsibility of elected representatives to use uh, the tax and spend responsibilities that we have uh, in a way that helps the economy. And he has indicated that there's need for more. Just one quick thought about China, because another thing that appears to have bipartisan yeah. support right now on Capitol Hill is some legislation, including possibly delisting some Chinese companies. Is that going to make it, it's been through the Senate, is it going to make it through the House? And might it have ramifications for the markets overall? I, this is something we just learned of. It passed uh, on, with unanimous consent, so there wasn't much debate or uh, we don't know who voted. For, it's unanimous consent. So we'll review it in the House. I've asked my committees to take a look at what that is. I take second place to no one uh, in the Congress, House or Senate, and my criticisms of China's uh, uh, trade policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States over decades, their human rights policies, their proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, right now, whether it's the Uyghurs, the people of Hong Kong, Tibet, you name it, they have been very oppressive and even more so. But the fact is that we have to judge every, uh, we have to have a relationship with China and we judge every action as to what it means to us as well as what it means to them. So I look forward to seeing that. It's interesting that it had such unanimous support, though, in the Senate. That was Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. It's an open question whether China comes out of this pandemic stronger or weaker, a question that was answered by Tony Blinken, former Deputy Secretary of State. I think they're in, 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 in some ways stronger, but that's, uh, in a sense, less a function of, um, uh, of the virus and the response to the virus and more a function, unfortunately, uh, from my perspective, of um, United States policy over the last uh, the last few years. If you think about it, David, um, the approach that President Trump has taken is helping uh, China achieve four big strategic uh, objectives. Um, first, weakening our alliances. China sees our, our, our voluntary alliances as a source of strength for us and weakness for them. Unfortunately, President Trump has taken a sledgehammer to our alliances, and uh, they are in much worse shape than, uh, than they were when he came to office. Second, uh, our administration has left a leadership vacuum around the world that China is only too happy to fill. Uh, we see that now even in the, uh, in the World Health Organization, which for all its problems uh, and need for reform, 
uh, is nonetheless an important organization. Uh, we've abandoned it. Uh, China's filling the vacuum, and you can see that across the board. That's a way for China to expand its influence uh, and the United States to lose influence. Um, third, uh, this administration has given uh, Beijing free reign uh, when it comes to uh, uh, human rights uh, with the Uyghurs, for example, a million people in uh, what amount to concentration camps, uh, as well as cracking down on democracy in, uh, in Hong Kong uh, and uh, rationing up tensions uh, with, with Taiwan, with nary a word from uh, President Trump. And finally, uh, when it comes to uh, investing in our own future uh, and uh, under-investing in our own democracy, um, you know, we've seen uh, this administration uh, under-invest in our, in our future and the competitiveness of our workers, and maybe just as important, uh, reduce the appeal of the United States and our democracy in the eyes of the world, all of which the government in Beijing takes uh, advantage of. So it's a long way of saying that I think China is in a stronger position uh, geostrategically uh, than it's been, um, and that's in, in part uh, the result of the actions that this administration has taken. That was former Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken. Coming up, former head of Goldman Sachs Lloyd Blankfein says we have to get the economy going again at some point for the sake of people's health as well as their financial well-being. It's not just health versus economy, it's economy on both sides. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Former Goldman Sachs chairman and CEO Lloyd Blankfein has spent a career assessing and managing risk. And he says that there is health risk to be incurred whenever we open the economy. It's not whether, it's when. There's a lot that's unknown and un unknowable. And moreover, I know that no one knows. And so that's, a, that's an aspect of this because you can dig and dig and dig. Uh, but basically, I think with this current moment, we're not so much in the realm of forecasting. I think we're in the realm of contingency planning. And I think one of those contingencies you have to plan for is, you know, the surprise. Most of the time in my, in my former life, surprises were almost always bad surprises. Something would go wrong. And of course, we were so big and extensive, there's nothing that could go wrong anywhere in the world that wouldn't affect us. Um, but I would say in this particular moment, and we're seeing a little bit of, of that today, uh, the tail, i.e., the possibility of something highly improbable happening, uh, could actually be good for the market. So somebody announces they're making progress with a vaccine. So it's a funny situation where if something flat, if I was watching the news and something flashed on and there was some surprise coming, I'm actually looking forward to hear it, hearing it, whereas before it was almost always going to be negative. One of the aspects we're seeing in this is what appears to be a very difficult choice between, on the one hand, public health, safety, well-being, lives, and on the other hand, the economy. Do you think that we're striking that balance more or less the right way? It's not just health versus economy. It's health, it's economy on both sides. And by the way, the health issues may be more neutral than some people think. You know, once the curve is, you know, orig the original intent to flatten the curve was just to stretch out the exposures that people would have so it didn't overwhelm the healthcare system. But the fact of the matter is, I think, unless we are going to hunker down until a vaccine comes up or until the a virus is obliterated from the face of the earth, which I think is too long to keep the whole country on welfare, eventually people are going to go back. And when they come back, the infection rate is going to go up. So I think we're just postponing the exposures and the infections of course, to a time when we're better able to deal with it than we were at the beginning, but we're not going to avoid health problems uh, from this virus unless we wanted to freeze the economy for too long that anybody can really think, could really contemplate. We've heard a fair amount out of both President Trump and the Federal Reserve, particularly Jay Powell, the chair, recently. And it seems from Chair Powell we're hearing two things. One is the Fed will do pretty much whatever it can, whatever it needs to, to really support the economy as best it can. But on the other hand, a lot of caution that this may take longer than we think, it may be more difficult than we think, and even the possibility of long-term damage. How do you assess the possible damage to the U.S. economy over the longer term? Well, obviously, it depends on how long this goes on. And, you know, you could see, it's easy to see what damage would be. You know, you have rest certain businesses that come into contact with the public that are going to go away, that were operating at tight margins anyway. 
uh, that won't so, that won't that can't afford to wait until they reopen, and some businesses that will reopen at such a reduced level that they won't be profitable, so they won't reopen, and that's damage. And those businesses, unfortunately and sadly, will go out of business. The people who work for them will find other jobs. The economy is resilient, so it will sort out, but it'll take some time. I'm reluctant to use the word permanent. The economy will be changed, but you know, you know we're you know we're all resilient. Uh, and it will uh, come back. I think one of the things to consider is how long this goes on. I mean, I think the the, um, the the you know the chairman and the Federal Reserve Board have done an extraordinary job. And of course, I want them to replace. That's it's not so much a stimulus as a replacement of lost, uh, uh, you know, a substitute for what people would have earned and try to keep it going. But one of the things that's on my mind is how long can you sustain that? Um, you have, a, you know, if you have a three trillion dollar grant, and I'm talking about the Federal Reserve now and Congress's outright grants and loans, um, how long can you sustain? Can we have another three trillion dollar round in ten weeks? Another three trillion round after that? At some point, even if we wanted to do that, what's out? You know, will people, will other outside investors and central banks around the world continue to fund the the, the compounding deficit that we're mounting? I, I think. Um, they're doing everything they can. They're doing everything they should. I applaud them in the fog of war to have been so coherent and so quick off the block, but I think it can't go on forever. Well, it raises the question whether, in fact, there might be some risk to the financial system itself. That was the big problem back when you were managing Goldman Sachs in 2008, 2009. Thus far, it hasn't been that big a problem, but now the Fed is starting to wor worry about things like commercial real estate. Do you see any risk on the horizon for the financial system? Look, anybody who says there's no risk on a horizon is uh, is crazy and blind. I'd say the financial. Uh, again, I'm not talking as an insider now, but but as a you know as a pretty alert and attentive observer, I know that uh, the balance sheets and the liquidity of banks were extraordinary. And I don't necessarily mean that as a compliment to the people who have been and are running the banks. I think the the legislation uh, post the financial crisis and the way in which the, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, tests for these, uh, you know, for liquidity and safety and solvency uh, have been extraordinary. And the, the banks have been on their toes and have been very well capitalized. And it's worked out pretty well. I would say that the most critics of historical critics of the banks would have to acknowledge that they've been that they're very liquid, liquid and fairly safe. Now, can I contemplate that something goes on so long, this huge, massive default, blah, blah, you know, and all that stuff? Uh, sure, but I would say that on a list of 10 things to worry about or even 25 things to worry about, I don't think that should be, that should be high on that, uh, it should be on the list at all right now. So but beyond course, the financial system overall, uh, are the banks less attractive as an investment as they used to be? I mean, certainly we're seeing that in the airlines right now. We're seeing that in hotels. And you see things like Berkshire Hathaway trimming back on Goldman Sachs as well as J.P. Morgan in the investment. Are they a less attractive an investment given this crisis? Look, it's bad for banks. Uh, loan growth is slow. Uh, you worry about the existing loans on your, uh, on your balance sheet. At the same time, there's a lot of financing and refinancing going on in the market. There's a, you know, a lot of people have to adjust their portfolios, and so tr uh, there's, a, there's a, a lot more trading uh, and opportunities in that part of the market. So I don't, I don't know that every aspect of this has to be uh, uh, bad for banks, but if you're asking me, re you know, there's reality, there's the economy, and there's markets. Markets have, uh, in ever, certainly ever since the financial crisis, have been very, uh, you know, have always had an arched eyebrow uh, when, in, when uh, approaching investment in, uh, in banks. That was former chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blankfein. Coming up, the head of Bank of America, Brian Moynihan, says that government efforts to cushion the blow to the economy are working. The question is how people will react as we start the economy back up. The length of this is going to be how the consumers behave, given the high levels of unemployment that you've seen published. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Every state in the union has now eased its restrictions to one degree or another. States like Connecticut, for example, are allowing non-essential retail stores to reopen under strict guidelines. But even easing restrictions could leave consumer-related sectors with a long road back. 
I think the notion that we are facing a V-shaped recovery where it's all going to bounce back, car sales are going to go back to 17 million, people are going to travel and spend and go to Disney World and all those kinds of things is, is frankly a fantasy. It's not just a matter of what consumers can do, but it's what they're willing to do. It matters whether or not there is a consumer demand for those unstructured activities, things that you do by choice. Nobody's forcing you to go take a cruise. It's going to be L-shaped for them. And the future of retail could be changed forever. A Jeffries survey finds that only one in five consumers will go to physical stores as soon as restrictions end. The only bright spots in U.S. retail sales for the month of April were groceries and non-store sales, including online sellers such as Amazon, which was up 8.4%. People are focusing on essential purchases like groceries and pharmacy purchases. There's a big movement from brick and mortar to uh, e-commerce. And there could be even more pain ahead for consumers as people start to run low on cash. It is stunning how, how quickly Households get into financial trouble, how little many lower income households have in the way of financial resources. We aren't seeing the kinds of stress in the credit markets we might have expected, and that's because the massive fiscal and monetary support is having at least some effect. But Bank of America Chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan says that the real test will come as we start the economy back up and we discover whether the consumer is willing to become fully engaged. Our view hasn't changed, but it comes back to what I said before. This is a health care crisis, and as you're starting to see the health care crisis be mitigated, not solved yet, you're starting to see the economy uh, start to recover, and we can talk about that. But the approach to winning uh, the war against the crisis uh, for us has been a customer-centric, community-centric, employee-centric move. And so you know, we've been out there driving it. We've been supporting our clients and trying to make sure they have the credit and capital to uh, uh, to do what they need to do and, and help them through this trough of activity in the second quarter. And you can see that in the loan balance is extended to PPP loans and other things we've done. We've helped our consumer clients through waivers so they have the ability to have better cash flow in a house. We've helped our teammates by saying no layoffs so they know their job is secure and then getting them safe and working from home. And then we've helped our communities by contributions in, uh, of $100 million in CDFI. Uh, investments, which are community development financial institutions at $250 million, of which about $170 million is already out. So all that is offsetting the impacts of the current uh, second quarter downdraft that you've seen with the unemployment numbers. And we don't see it much differently. It's just that we're starting to see us come out the other side of this, frankly. Uh, so we have heard from the Federal Reserve, and they've expressed some concern, at least, that as this pandemic continues, there may be some threat to the overall system. And specifically, they talk, for, for example, about commercial real estate. Are you seeing some parts of the market that are particularly vulnerable on the credit side? Remember that the, the U.S. economy is going to be dependent on the activity of the consumer uh, base. And, and so you always have to start there when you talk about the U.S. So even though we have this year from the Bank of America research team, which is the best in the world, you know, being minus 5%, 5.5% this year and plus 5% next year, the real question will be how do consumers behave. And, and what we've seen since the low point in the second, couple, first couple of weeks of April in terms of everything, in terms of their spending because of uh, the stay-at-home edicts, in terms of their borrowing activity, uh, in terms of the uh, transfer of money, um, you saw all that fall to a lowest level. And obviously things like travel and hotels and things are most affected. But as you've seen steadily as you went through the third week of April and on into the first part of May, you're seeing – their activities pick up even in the states that are still under stay from home, and you're seeing the activity pick up much quicker in the places they're going back to work. And so for the month of May, we're seeing it down about you know, 2, 3, 4 percent versus last year. Uh, for the year today, it's down a couple percent. And that's the question. The length of this is going to be how the consumers behave given the, the high levels of unemployment that you've seen published when people get back to work, jobs coming back in the stimulus payments, which are all hitting the street of the last few weeks, and how it all works together to see if the consumer's behavior changed. And when, I hear, when you hear Governor, uh, Chair Powell and others, the concern I have is have we changed consumer behavior as we look out across the next you know, four, five, six quarters? Well, that is a key question, maybe the key question, Brian, clearly. When it comes to the consumer, I know you've already taken about $4.8 billion reserve against credit, possible losses. Given the level of unemployment, which is really quite stunning, do you think that's going to be enough? Well, what you've seen so far is uh, with the consumer help, you know, we've, we've uh, uh, granted about a million and a half payment deferrals. 
But if you look at the actual uh, interesting statistics, about 35 or 40 percent of the people asked for a credit card payment deferral went ahead and made the payment. And if you go and look at those consumers, what you see is because the uh, – Leave aside the, the, the issue of you know, where the money is coming from. You're seeing higher balance in our account, and that's because the stimulus between you know, the EIP payments, between the enhanced unemployment, the, these measures taken by Congress and by the administration, by the Fed, have worked to offset the unfortunate aspects of very high unemployment. And so, so far, you're not seeing the delinquencies and things rise. You've asked, you've seen payment deferrals. Uh, increase, but you're seeing them start to level off and come down in our book. And so we, we expect to see, you know, charge-offs coming later on as as, as this thing goes on. But you, but the reality is right now you're not see, seeing the kind of credit damage that you'd expect to see with this amount of downdraft and activity. The question is what happens next, and that's what we're all watching. Finally, uh, we're going to hear from uh, uh, Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell. He's been doing a fair amount of talking already. What would you like to hear? Well, I think people have to step back. You know, there's a, a the PPP program is now you know still has money left. The applications are still coming in. The dollar volume of loans is is going up, but the number of loans is going up faster. So the loans are smaller and smaller. In our case, we've done 320,000 of them as of this morning. 80,000 average balance. Uh, it's 98% of the employers are under 100. 80% are under uh, 10 employees, uh, and so these are small businesses that are getting the help they need. And so I think what you want to hear is where's the next rounds of uh, their ideas to continue to put money into the economy to help, because it's not an unlimited resource, um, so we need to keep adding it carefully. And the areas I think that need the most help in the near term are the states because of the incredible budget pressure they've been put under. And if we don't help them, we'll see them have to make budget adjustments, which will add the unemployment burden to the hospitals and things, a similar issue in terms of uh, having to shut down and lose revenue, and they need to get that whole plug so they can get back to it. And in some respects, some of the nonprofits and the performance nonprofits, especially the same issue, universities. So the, the idea is the stimulus has to continue to help Americans through the unemployment assist benefits uh, uh, and things like that. But also has to, it can be targeted in the next rounds towards these places that just have operating holes that we have to decide as a society we're going to replace so that they can get back and provide the great services they provide. And so that's what you like to hear. In terms of the work, and the, the, there's a lot of discussion about facilities and usage and other, up and operating. A lot of these facilities were put in place to stabilize, and you see massive stabilization in the market so that you know, high-grade issuance will have another record month probably this month. Uh, 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 you know, high yield will have a strong month. Uh, if you're starting to see converts and some equity deals get done. The stabilization and the fact those facilities aren't all used is actually good news. That means the markets are doing what they're doing and providing capital. So what I think people get focused on is how much money is outstanding on facility X or something. The reality is having it there provides a comfort that the private sector can drive it and the banking system can drive it. So whether it's Main Street, whether it's some of these other facilities, you know, the debate ought to be not about whether they're being used, about the good news if they're not being used. That means you've seen stability in the funding structures. That was Brian Moynihan, Chairman and CEO of Bank of America. Coming up, restaurants have been particularly hard hit in the crisis, and they will be one of the early indicators of whether consumers want to return to some form of business as usual. We talk with Danny Meyer, CEO of the Union Square Hospitality Group, about what that business as usual may look like. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Well, restaurants have been particularly hard hit by this pandemic, which means they're particularly anxious to get back to business as soon as possible. We talked with famed restaurateur Danny Meyer. He's the head of the Union Square Hospitality Group. And he said that how fast they can get back to business depends in part on what kind of restaurant they are. The uh, full service restaurant uh, segment is going to probably have the toughest time coming back. And that's where most but not all of our restaurants lie. I think the fast casual, fine casual restaurant segment is going to come back well sooner because those are businesses that didn't necessarily rely on how many people were sitting in the dining room at the same time. They've, they've had a pretty robust takeout and pickup and delivery model coming into this. So that's a really good segment. Um, so we'll, we'll see how it all goes. 
So uh, what does that mean for your operation? Because you're really known for a lot for high-end restaurants, which you go into and you eat. You do not take out so much, although you do have some of the latter as well. As you look forward to opening back up, what does that tell you about uh, how you're going to open up? I think what is going to what we're all going to see in the full service business is that for some period of time, and we don't really know how long it's going to last, the only way to recover any kind of revenue is going to be to to bring people back to work safely. And what that means is that in a kitchen, which is not designed for people to be uh, working, you know, six feet apart from one another, you're going to see way, way fewer menu items. Um, you're going to see fewer uh, hours of operation because you can't bring in a whole bunch of different people, a whole bunch of different crews working cheek to jowl the way we used to. And you're probably going to see businesses that are finding entrepreneurial ways to, to cook really good food uh, and to, to share that food, but not by welcoming people into their restaurants. So, so what does it mean in the meantime? We hear stories about going in and having waiters in masks and maybe having plexiglass between tables, not having nearly as many tables. Is that sustainable for the restaurant industry? You were widely quoted as saying, I'm not sure we can really reopen until a vaccine comes. I'm not sure that was exactly in context. But do we need to wait till there's a vaccine before we can really go back to a restaurant, eat and dining? I don't think it's going to be about waiting till a vaccine. I, I think that it's going to be waiting till the public at large um, develops a kind of demand that says we, you know, we read the news just like everybody reads the news. We read scientific reports. And when the public at large collectively feels a sense of confidence about going out and dining in restaurants, that's when you're going to see things start to happen. And I think in the meantime, it's going to be tough, David, because restaurants, the way that, the, way the restaurant economy works it's been uh, it's been pretty hard with decreasing uh, margins for many many years to make money anything less than I'd say about eighty percent occupancy. So, if to make it safe to bring people into our restaurants, we're looking at fifty or forty or thirty percent occupancy. I just I just don't really know how I don't really know how restaurants can do that uh, for a whole long for 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 very much time. Nobody got into this industry because it was an easy buck. We got into this business because we love taking care of people and because we're entrepreneurs who always find another way. And we're going to find some really interesting new revenue models right now where we can provide our hospitality to you even when you're not in our restaurant. And if we're really lucky, some of those methods and business scenarios will actually endure and help our industry even after we get back uh, to serving you inside the restaurant. That was Danny Meyer of the Union Square Hospitality Group. Coming up, we wrap up the week with Larry Summers. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is, this is Wall Street, Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David West, and we wrap up the week this week, we do every week, with our very special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, we had some experience this week with some economies starting to open up. We had Georgia start to open up first. We also have uh, Sweden that never really closed very much. What are we learning from that? Uh, is it, does it, do the consumers come bouncing right back? I think we're learning something... Um that was quite surprising to me, though perhaps it should not have been. Uh, lockdown is actually less the issue than people's fear. If you look at what's happened to consumer spending, it's come back some in Georgia, but it's also come down, it's also come back in New York and to just about exactly the same extent. If you look at Sweden, which never closed down, and Denmark, which closed down pretty rigorously. Many more people have died in Sweden, but there hasn't been much difference in what's happened to consumer spending or the economy. The Swedish economy's dipped 80% as much as the Danish economy has. The reality is that what this is more about is not the lockdown, but the virus and people's degree of confidence. And if you think about it, that makes sense. 
if they opened up all the restaurants to go sit in one, I wouldn't go sit in a restaurant now, even though I like uh, restaurants. I think most of us are more constrained by our desire to be prudent about our health and prudent about the health of people we might pass a virus on to than we are constrained by some law that some governor uh, decrees. That just underscores what I've been saying for some weeks, that ultimately the most important economic policies are the health policies, whether it's testing or therapy or uh, vaccination that or contact tracing that can put this problem in the rear view mirror. And until we do that, I don't think we're really gonna fix the fundamental economic concern and when we do that, we've got a prospect of a reasonably rapid uh, recovery. But I think we have learned something important that this great debate about lockdowns is actually less of a debate than we have all thought about it as being, because people who don't believe in the lockdown in the United States don't respect it and honor it, and people who are scared, don't go out, even if the lockdown uh, is uh, removed. I saw that one of the prominent Washington think tanks um, has announced that it's not going to have any visitors until the end of the year, and it's not going to have anybody back in their offices until September at the earliest. Well, you know, they're not waiting to see what gets decreed by the president or by the mayor of Washington, D.C. Right. You're seeing a lot of uh, right. that kind of thing. This is going to be based more on decentralized decision making of people who assess right. risks to themselves uh, is, I think, what we've right. learned here. Yeah, as you say, Larry, consumers are going to vote with their feet as a practical matter, but you've been a staunch advocate for a much ramped up testing and contact tracing program. Is it possible that could be enough to restore the confidence to the consumer, to the worker, or do we really have to wait to a vaccine as a practical, ma a practical matter? Look, I don't think this is going to be behind us till we have a vaccine or a convincing and highly credible, uh, uh, highly credible uh, kind of uh, therapy. I do think that if we did the right things with testing, that all kinds of private ways of employers testing their employees before they come back and retesting them on a periodic basis. Universities uh, opening to at least some extent based on the fact that they were gonna test each student uh, with uh, some, period, some periodicity. Um, I think these kinds of things will start to happen if we have testing, and there'll be a further multiplier uh, from uh, testing uh, if we can uh, do it uh, more, uh, per more pervasively. So I do think that ramping up testing should be a very great priority. I suspect the utility of testing will come in a more decentralized way than I probably would have imagined a few weeks ago. It'll be employers, it'll be airlines, um, not wanting to have anybody with the virus uh, on uh, their planes. It'll be similar uh, things for entering into various kinds of uh, activities. Right, right. So Larry, if the markets didn't have enough to worry about with the virus, we also injected a growing conflict with China, U.S.-China. Uh, and we have, of course, the People's uh, Congress meeting and taking various actions. We have up on the Hill a, mo a move to delist some Chinese companies, pass the Senate, it's pending before the House. In the meantime, we had the Secretary of State Pompeo say we're going to review the tr special trade status for Hong Kong because Hong Kong actually is sort of a victim, perhaps, of Beijing saying we're going to have a new security law. Does that make sense right now, given what's going on with the global economy and the U.S. economy? I don't get it. Um, Hong Kong's a victim, so why punish them? I don't think they're going to do any important damage to China 
uh, by fooling around with Hong Kong's trade status, but you're going to hurt the people of Hong Kong even worse uh, than uh, they're hurting uh, now. So I don't really see uh, the logic. I, I sympathize. I am, I feel for the fact that the warnings that were given at the time when uh, I was in I was in government uh, at the time and went to Hong Kong and spoke about uh, the importance of one country two systems as really a test of China's uh, credibility and China doesn't appear to be meeting that test and it's tragic but it seems like to the extent we want to be taking any action it should be towards uh, China not towards the victim. Uh, which is Hong Kong. I don't really what, understand what about- why preventing Americans, f- preventing Chinese companies from listing on the American stock market when they meet the relevant capital market requirements is going to serve American interests. It seems to me that it's going to reduce our degree of influence and leverage over those companies and over China. It's going to make it harder for Americans to make investments. It's not going to really impact on those countries' ability to access capital. It's going to be a great gift uh, to stock exchanges in Singapore, to stock exchanges uh, in London. Ironically, it may be a big gift to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. At the same time, other people in the administration are trying to damage uh, the Hong Kong economy. So I don't think we have a policy that's defined by its uh, coherence. I think a mature policy would recognize that at this point we are not friends with China and probably not going to be friends or allies or partners in uh, the foreseeable future. We are uh, two very strong individuals in a small lifeboat, in a turbulent sea, a long way from the shore. We don't need to like each other, but we do need to cooperate with each other. And pursuing tit-for-tat acts of revenge, even if we're right in some abstract sense, that weaken anger, hurt, and alienate them is not going to serve our objective of uh, getting to uh, the shore. So we need to find a way of elevating this relationship uh, past tit for tat um, into adulthood. Yeah, which will be a particular challenge in a presidential election year, I dare say. Thank you so much, Larry Summers, our special contributor, of course, former Secretary of Treasury. That does it for Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. I hope we see you next week.